order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Dr. Rupa Hak. Number one, please, Mr. Speaker. E. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the whole House will be shocked by the appalling news that 39 bodies have been discovered in a lorry container in Essex. Uh, this is an unimaginable tragedy and, and truly heartbreaking. I know that the thoughts and prayers of all members are with those who lost their lives and their loved ones. I'm, I'm receiving regular updates, and the Home Office will work closely with Essex Police as we establish exactly of what has happened, and my honourable friend, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, will be making an oral statement immediately after these questions. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Dr. Rupa Hark. Mr. Speaker, can I completely associate myself with the remarks the Prime Minister made about the tragedy in Essex? Um, I don't normally do that, but on this occasion. I completely am with him. Good to see the PM at PMQs. In nearly 100 days, I think until today, it was, he'd only ever done one. The Prime Minister has, we all know, a long list of shortcomings. So, would he, so could he do something? So could he do something? So please, could he do something about one that he does have some control of and get rid of Dominic Cummings? <laughs> well, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I think the, I'll try to re re reply in the, in the, the, with the generosity of, of, of spirit that uh, she, would, uh, she would expect from me and, and just say that uh, I receive excellent advice from a wide range of, uh, of advisers and officials, and it is the role of advisers to advise and of government to decide, and I take full responsibility for everything uh, that this government does. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. My, my right honourable friend achieved what many said was impossible and negotiated a new Brexit deal yeah, yeah, which passed yeah, through this House yeah, last night. Yeah. Does the Prime Minister share my regret that many in the party opposite, including the Leader of the Opposition, Check voted to delay us leaving with a deal on October the 31st yeah, yeah, once yeah. again? Not least after what he said in this House on the 22nd of February 2016 that his party welcomed the fact that it is now up to the British people to decide whether we remain in the European Union. My, my right honourable friend, as so often, speaks with complete uh, good sense, and I, I do think it was a remarkable thing that so many members of the House were able to come together uh, last night and uh, approve the second reading uh, of the bill. Uh, I think it was a great shame that the House, as it were, willed the end, uh, Mr Speaker, but not the means. But there is still time uh, for the right honourable gentleman to do that and to explain to the people of this country how he proposes to honour his promise that he made repeatedly and deliver on the will of the people and get Brexit done. And, and perhaps, Mr Speaker, he will enlighten us now. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join others who have offered their deep sadness at today's news of 39 people being found dead in a lorry container in Greys. Can we just think for a moment of what it must have been like for those 39 people obviously in a desperate and dangerous situation, for their lives to end, suffocated to death in a container. This is an unbelievable human tragedy that happened in our country at this time. We obviously need to look at the whole situation and answers to what has happened there. But also, I do pay an enormous tribute to the emergency services who have gone to the scene to deal with it. All of us should just think for a moment what it's like to be a police officer or a firefighter to open that container and have to remove 39 bodies from it and deal with them in, a pro in an appropriate and humane way. We should just think for a moment of what inhumanity is done to other, other human beings at this terrible moment. <laughs> Yesterday, Mr Speaker, before the Prime Minister decided to, withdraw, to delay his own withdrawal bill, he promised to maintain... <laughs> let me finish. Let me finish decided to delay his own withdrawal bill in, 
If you care to look at Hansard, you'll see what it says. He promised, he promised to maintain environmental, consumer and workers' rights. Why then did the Prime Minister have these commitments removed from the legally binding withdrawal agreement? Uh, Mr Speaker, I don't think we could have been clearer yesterday uh, in our uh, commitment to have the highest possible standards for, uh, for workers' rights, uh, for environmental standards. And uh, indeed, I think one of the things that brought the House together was the knowledge that as we, uh, as we go forward and build our future partnership with the EU, it will always be open uh, to members on all sides of the House uh, to work together to ensure that whatever the EU comes up with, we can match and pass into the law of this country. And that, I think, commanded a lot of support and a lot of assent across the House. And I must say I find it peculiar uh, that, he, uh, that he now wants this bill uh, back because he voted against it uh, last night and, and, he, and, he whipped, and, he whipped, and he whipped his entire Labour Party uh, against it. And I think it was a remarkable thing that the House uh, successfully uh, defied, uh, defied his urgings and approved that deal. What I, think, what I think we would like to hear from him now is his commitment to getting Brexit done. That is what the public want to hear. And, and I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, they are, worried, they are worried that all he wants is a second referendum. Jeremy Corbyn. The Prime Minister doesn't answer the question I put to him, which was about environmental, consumer and workers' rights. And I'm not surprised because... <coughs> I'm not surprised, Mr Speaker, because he once said employment regulation was backbreaking, and he voted for the 2016 Anti-Trade Union Act, which stripped away employment protections, and the provisions in the bill offer no real protection at all. <clears throat> Yesterday, in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill debate, the Prime Minister pledged that the NHS was safe in his hands. If that's the case... Will he be backing our amendment today, which would undo the very damaging privatisation so much of our NHS? Mr Speaker, I, th I think um, I must say he's showing complete uh, ignoratio elenca, as you say, complete failure to, uh, to study what we actually uh, passed last night in that historic, in that historic agreement. It is, it is very, very clear that it is open to this House uh, to do better where it chooses on animal welfare standards or on social protection, as indeed this country very often does. We lead the way. We are, we are, we are, a, we are a groundbreaker. We are a groundbreaker. Mr. Speaker, we are a groundbreaker in this in this country, and uh, I'm afraid to say I'm afraid to say that the right honourable gentleman has no other purpose in seeking to uh, frustrate uh, Brexit uh, than to uh, cause a second referendum. As for the NHS, Mr. Speaker, as for the NHS. Uh, this is the party of whose, uh, whose sound management of the economy took this country back from the abyss and enabled us to spend another £34 billion on the NHS, a record investment. And, and, Mr. Speaker, and, Mr Speaker, as I promised on the steps of Downing Street, to begin the upgrade of 20 hospitals. And as a result of the commitments this country is making, uh, this government is making, 40 new hospitals, Mr Speaker, will be built in the next 10 years. That is this party's commitment to the NHS. Uh, order! Oh, order! Order! Mr Russell Moyle, you are an incorrigible individual, yeah. yelling from a sedentary position at the top of your voice at every turn. Calm yourself, man. Take some sort of soothing medicament from which you will benefit. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two questions and we're still waiting for an answer. Although we could do with a... <clears throat> Although we could do, <clears throat> we could do with the translation of the first part of his response. Um, I hate to break it to the Prime Minister, but under his government and that of his predecessor, privatisation has more than doubled to £10 billion in our NHS. There are currently 20 NHS contracts out to tender. And when he's promised 40 hospitals, he then reduced that to 20, and then it turns out that reconfiguration is taking place in just six hospitals. And so these numbers keep tumbling down of his unfunded spending commitments that he liberally makes around the country. The Prime Minister continues to say that he will 
He continues to say well, he, he will exclude our NHS from being up for grabs in future trade deals. Can he point to which clause in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill secures that? Mr Speaker, I, I, I must say to him that he is completely wrong in what he says about privatisation of, of the NHS, and I must resist this, because those 40 new hospitals, those 47,000 extra clinical staff, including 17,000 nurses, they weren't paid for out of private funds, Mr Speaker, they were paid for by the NHS. And the, and the reason, and the reason we are able, the reason we're able to pay for them is because this party this party and this government believes in sound management exactly. of the economy, exactly. not recklessly putting up corporation tax, uh, not recklessly wrecking the economy in the way that in uh, renationalising uh, companies in the way that he would do. And he asks, he asks about uh, about the NHS in any future free trade deal, and I, he, I and I understand his visceral, I understand his visceral dislike of America and his visceral dislike. Like, and I understand his visceral dislike of free trade. Jeremy Corbyn! Uh, Mr Speaker, I actually asked the Prime Minister which clause in the bill protects our NHS, and obviously there's time for him to help us with an answer on that. He should also be aware that there's no public capital allocations made for the funding commitments that he's announced. All he said is the seed funding. I'm not sure what seed funding is, but it doesn't sound but it doesn't sound but it doesn't sound like the commitment that we were seeking, and it sounds awfully like private finance going into the NHS in order to uh, deal with the issues it faces. Mr Speaker. Less than one year ago, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, that any regulatory checks and custom controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland would damage the fabric of the Union. Given that this deal clearly does damage the fabric of the Union, does he still agree with himself? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I believe that, that, and I know that this was raised many times in the House yesterday, I believe that the Union is preserved and indeed we are able to go forward together as one United Kingdom and do free trade deals in a way that would have been impossible under previous, under previous deals. Uh, this is a great advance for the whole of the UK and we intend to develop that together with our friends in Northern Ireland. But I must say to the Right Honourable Gentleman and indeed his colleagues on the front bench that I think it's a bit rich, a bit rich, Mr Speaker, to hear from him about his sentimental attachment to the fabric of the union between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, when he has spent most of his political lifetime supporting the IRA and those who were destroyed by violence. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker the Prime Minister has a a habit of not answering of not answering any questions that's put to him Northern Ireland will remain on single market rules within the EU on goods and agricultural products. The rest of the UK will not. As the Honourable Member East Antrim pointed out yesterday, it does create a very real border down the Irish Sea, something he said in terms to a DUP conference he would never do. And it wasn't that long ago. It may be when he was trying to become the Tory party leader that he said that. The Prime Minister told the House on Saturday there would be no checks on goods moving between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, yet yesterday the Brexit Secretary confirmed to the Lords European Union Committee that Northern Irish businesses sending goods to Britain would have to complete export declaration forms. Is the Prime Minister right on this or is the Brexit Secretary right on this? They can't both be right. Yes. Mr Speaker, let's be absolutely clear that the, the United Kingdom is preserved whole and entire by these arrangements and indeed the whole of the UK will be allowed to come out of the European Union Customs Union so that we can do free trade deals together. There will be no, there will be no checks between Northern Ireland and GB and there will be no tariffs, there will be no tariffs between Northern Ireland and and, and there will be no tariffs between Northern Ireland and GB because we have protected the customs union. And I may say, Mr Speaker, 
this, this, this lachrymose defence of the union, uh, as I say, comes a little ill from somebody who not only campaigned uh, to break up uh, the union between Great Britain and Northern Ireland by his support of the IRA, but who also, Mr Speaker, wants to spend the whole of the next year in a, in a referendum not just on the EU, but another referendum on Scotland, Mr Speaker. That's what he wants. This is a threat to our United Kingdom on the Labour front bench. Mr Speaker, I really do wonder if the Prime Minister has read Clause 21 of his own bill. The Good Friday Agreement was one of the greatest achievements of this House, led by a Labour government at that time. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister unlawfully prorogued Parliament. He said he would refuse to comply with the law. He threw Northern Ireland under a bus. He ripped up protections for workers' rights and environmental standards, lost every vote along the way, and tried to prevent genuine democratic scrutiny and debate. He once said the whole withdrawal bill, as signed by the previous Prime Minister, is a terrible treaty. And yet this deal is even worse than that, even if, it's not, even if he's not that familiar with it. Does the Prime Minister accept that Parliament should have the necessary time to improve on this worse than terrible treaty? Mr Speaker, it it is this Government and this party that delivers on the mandate of the people. And and, and and I I listen carefully to what the Right Honourable Gentleman just said, but he said it before, Mr Speaker. They said that we couldn't couldn't open the withdrawal agreement, and we did. They said we couldn't get rid of the backstop, and we did. They said said we couldn't get a new deal, Mr Speaker, and we did. And then they said said that we'd never get it through Parliament. And they did their utmost, didn't they? They did their utmost to stop it going through Parliament. And we got it through Parliament last night, Mr. Speaker. And this is the party, and this is the government. Uh, this is the party, and this is the government that delivers on its promises. We said we would put 20,000 more police officers on the streets of this country, and we are. We said we'd upgrade 20 hospitals, and we are. We said we'd upgrade, we'd uplift education funding around the whole country, and, we're, and more, and even more than that, Mr. Speaker. We are increasing the minimum wage, increasing the living wage by the biggest, the biggest amount since its inception. This is the party, Mr Speaker, that delivers on Brexit and delivers on the priorities of the British people. There will be more of that, colleagues, can be entirely assured. Closed question, Martin Vickers. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Number six, Mr. Speaker. Well done. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we will invest in infrastructure in every corner of the UK, uh, including uh, £13 billion on transport in the north of the country. Martin Vickers. I thank my right honourable friend for his reply. Uh, one thing that would encourage investment in uh, northern Lincolnshire and boost the local c- economy is free port status for the Humber ports in or- and improved access to those ports by an upgrade to the A15 between Lincoln and the A180 and improved east west rail freight connections. Could uh, my right honourable friend uh, uh, confirm uh, support for those uh, proposals? Yeah. Uh, I can indeed, Mr Speaker, uh, confirm support for those proposals, and I, I, I well remember meeting the, uh, my honourable friend and, and his constituents in the, in the corridor, I think, in Port Cully's house, uh, when they raised with me, in addition, the issue of the crossing of the railway line at Suggets Lane, uh, Mr Speaker. And I wish to, I wish to assure my honourable friend that Suggets Lane is never far from my thoughts. And, and, uh, I, and, and I have undertakings from the Department of Transport that uh, they will seek to find a, a, a solution, a safe means for pedestrians to cross the railway line uh, at Suggins Lane, uh, Suggins Lane, in addition to the other pledges I have made him today. Ian Blackford. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. The loss of life that we have learned about this morning in Essex, 39 people that have been taken from this earth should distress us all. 
and the fact that this should happen in the United Kingdom we need to dwell on, that people put themselves in such situation in the search of a better life. And we must not just brush this off as an incident. We have to learn the lessons as to why this has happened. Our thoughts and prayers must be with everyone. And those from the emergency services that have had to avail themselves of this most shocking sight this morning. We must not just have warm words today, and that's the end of it. As a humanity, we must learn from this terrible, terrible tragedy. Mr Speaker, within the last hour, the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales joined forces to oppose the Tory government's damaging Brexit bill. A bill that risks jobs, opportunities and our entire economic future. Mr Speaker, Scotland did not vote for this toxic Tory Brexit or any Brexit. It voted overwhelmingly to remain. Will the Prime Minister stop ignoring Scotland and confirm today that he will not allow this legislation to pass unless consent is given by the Scottish Parliament. Yes or no, Prime Minister? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I note very carefully what the uh, Right Honourable General had to say, but uh, as he knows, the, the Scottish Parliament has no uh, role in uh, approving this deal. On the contrary, on the contrary it, is up to, it is up to the people uh, of this uh, up to the members of this parliament to approve the deal. I am delighted to say that uh, they did. Uh, they, uh, it did not proceed, I think, with the support of many uh, Scottish Nationalist MPs, uh, but if, uh, or any of them. But if he, if he really still uh, disagrees with this deal, and he disagrees about the way forward, then can I propose to him, can I propose to him that he has a word with other opposition parties, and he joins uh, our support for a general election uh, to settle the matter? Ian Blackford. Well, there we have it, Mr. Speaker. The legislative consent that the Scottish Parliament has asked is meaningless in the Prime Minister's eyes. So much for the respect agenda, so much for the message in 2014 that we were to lead the United Kingdom, that this was a union of equals, torn asunder by the disrespect of this Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, well, they don't like the truth, but the people of Scotland have heard it from the Prime Minister today. Our Parliament doesn't matter. That's what this Prime Minister thinks of our government in Scotland. Mr Speaker, last night the Prime Minister was yet again defeated by this House. The Prime Minister said he would pull his bill. He hasn't. He wants Scotland to trust him. But how can we? Fired twice for lying found unlawful by the courts. The Prime Minister has sold Scotland out time and time again. Yeah. Parliament, Scotland, cannot trust this Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister so desperately wants an election, Europe is willing and waiting. What's stopping him? He must now secure a meaningful extension and bring on a general election. Let the Scottish people people decide our future in Scotland. Well, Mr Speaker, what an exciting development. <laughs> perhaps he, perhaps, he, perhaps he, might, he might pass some of his, some of his courage down the, down the line. Uh, <laughs> But, but on, the, on the point that he raises, Mr Speaker, about our commitment to the Union, uh, he should know that uh, thanks to Scotland's membership of the Union, Scotland this year receives the biggest, the biggest ever block grant, £1.2 billion. Yeah. £200, million more, 200 million more secured for Scottish farming thanks to the hard work of Scottish, of Scottish Conservative MPs, Mr Speaker. And who is, really, who is letting down Scotland? It is the SNP with their lackadaisical, their lackadaisical government, the highest taxes anywhere in the UK, declining educational standards, inadequate health care and a European policy, a policy that would take the, take the Scotland back into the EU and hand back control of Scotland's fish to Brussels. If that's their manifesto, uh, Mr Speaker, then I look forward to contesting it with them at the polls. Sir David Amy, 
Yes. When my right honourable friend was seeking to become leader of the Conservative Party, I was possibly the only one of our colleagues who asked him for anything in return for their support. Uh, I'm being charitable. Uh, I, I asked him for three things. One, that he would get Brexit done. Two, that he would make me a duke because my wife fancies becoming a duchess. And finally, something that the Leader of the Opposition certainly agrees with me, that Southend becomes a city. When will these things happen? Uh, well, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to my uh, right honourable friend, and grateful to him, by the way, for his su support, I may say. But uh, I, 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 and I, I can say to him that uh, our policy remains unchanged, that we should leave the EU on October the 31st, at the end of this month. Well, we will leave the EU on October the 31st, if we, uh, if we can make that, if our honourable members opposite will uh, comply. And that is what I will say to the EU, and I will report back to the House uh, in due course. On my, on my honourable friend's other two requests of, uh, of a duke, um, a duchess and a city, uh, I, 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 can I undertake, Mr. Speaker, through your to report back to the House on the, uh, on, on the progress that we're making? <laughs> Mr. Barry Shearman. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I wonder if the Prime Minister has seen the heartbreaking images of children being killed, mutilated, seriously injured on the Syrian border. And will he, given that the, Tur uh, the, the Turks are members of NATO and old allies of us, we fought with the Kurds, they are good and trusted friends, and the United States is a major ally of us, and he has a good relationship with Donald Trump. Will he step up to the plate yeah. and show that the British government cares about this and is willing to do something about it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I thank the, the right honourable gentleman, and he's absolutely right to raise this issue. And um, if I may say so, it is an appalling state of affairs, and the House will be aware of what is happening in, in northern Syria. Uh, this is something that the British government has actively deplored, and I have spoken uh, to President Erdogan. Uh, twice now, I think uh, both last weekend and this most recent weekend on the matter, uh, and urged him uh, to cease fire, urged for a, uh, a standstill, and uh, everybody I think in the House shares uh, the Royal Honourable Gentleman's feelings about the, the loss of civilian life. Uh, and it is particularly uh, unsettling to see uh, our, some of our close allies at variance in this matter. So the, the UK is working very closely now as uh, he would expect uh, with our French and uh, German friends to try to uh, bring an understanding uh, to President Erdogan of the risks that we think this policy is running and, of course, uh, to persuade our American friends that we cannot simply turn a blind eye to what is happening in Syria. And he is entirely correct in what he says. Yeah. Jackie Doyle Price. Yeah. 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 Thankful for the comments made by uh, members about the uh, tragic events that have been unfolded in my constituency uh, this morning. To put 39 people into a locked metal container shows a contempt for human life that is evil. And the best thing we can do in memory of those victims is to find the perpetrators and bring them to justice. Yeah. But would my right hon. Friend uh, join me in paying tribute to all those who attended the scene this morning that showed incredible leadership and professionalism. And let's remember, the scenes they witnessed will stay with them forever. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I entirely agree with what my honourable friend has said and indeed what uh, other colleagues already in this chamber have said today. It is hard to uh, put ourselves in the shoes of those uh, emergency services as, they, uh, as the right honourable gentleman uh, opposite said, uh, as they were asked uh, to uh, open uh, that container and uh, to expose the appalling crime that had taken place. And I, I must say I do share her strong desire now that the perpetrators of that crime, and indeed all those who engage in similar activity, because, because we know that this trade is going on, all such traders in human beings should be hunted down and brought to justice. Yeah. Brendan O'Hara. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker. In a dispute, diametrically opposing outcomes cannot be equally beneficial for both sides. So if the Prime Minister's great deal is so good for Northern Ireland seafood producers, allowing them access to the single market and the customs union, how would he describe his deal for the shellfish producers of Meyer Gale and Butte constituency, who fish in the same waters for exactly the same catch, but do not have access to the single market and the customs union? One has a great deal. What does the other one have? Um, Mr. Speaker, that I, I can tell uh, that the, the honourable gentleman that, of course, uh, the uh, fishing communities of, of Scotland have a fantastic opportunity uh, by the end of next year to take back control of their entire coastal waters, all 200 miles, of them, and to manage manage their fisheries in the interests in the interests of Scotland, and thereby to drive, if I may say so, an even better deal, an even even better deal, if an even better access to European markets, and that is an opportunity that will be wantonly thrown away, Mr. Speaker, uh, by the abject, abject, servile policy of the SNP, who would hand back control of Scottish fishing to Brussels. Mr. Kenneth Clark, uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday my right honourable friend achieved uh, the first landmark of his premiership by getting this House to vote by a comfortable majority in favour of, of, of Brexit. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, if he now proceeds in the uh, reasonable and statesmanlike way I would hope for, then he can go on in a month or two's time to actually deliver Brexit before having a general election on the sensible basis of a mandate for a government on the fuller negotiations that will follow. So will my right honourable friend Firstly, get over his disappointment and accept that October the 31st is now Halloween. It is devoid of any symbolic or political content and will fade away into historical memory very rapidly. So will he, having reflected, let us know that he's about to table a reasonable timetable motion so that this House can complete the task of finalising the details of the withdrawal bill so we can move on on a basis which might begin to reunite the nation once again for the future. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, my, my right honourable friend uh, makes a, a very reasonable case. That, alas, uh, we cannot now know what the EU uh, will do in response to uh, the request from uh, Parliament, I stress it wasn't my request, but a request from Parliament to, to, ask, uh, to ask for a delay. Uh, uh, we, are, we, are awaiting, we are awaiting, Mr Speaker, their reaction to Parliament's uh, request for a delay. I, I think myself, I must, I must respectfully disagree with my uh, right honourable friend, perhaps not for the first time, uh, I, th I think it would still be very much in the best interest of this country and of democracy to get Brexit done by October the 31st. I will wait to see uh, what our EU friends and partners say in response both to uh, the uh, request for a delay from Parliament and also to the insistence by Parliament that they want a delay. I don't think the people of this country want a delay. I don't want a delay. I intend to press on, but I'm afraid we now have to see what our EU friends will decide on our behalf. And that is the result of the decision that he took last night. Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The National Farmers Union reported this week that 16 million apples have rotted away because the immigrant workers that normally pick those for the country have chosen not to come. Now, immigration was clearly a big part of the EU referendum, and the Prime Minister has promised a points-based system, but that isn't going to allow for people coming here to pick fruit. So what does the Prime Minister intend to do to stop the scandal of British food rotting away in the fields? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are more EU nationals uh, living and working in this country than ever, uh, than ever before, and that's, a, that's in, in many ways a, a, a great thing. But uh, we have, as he knows, uh, the EU settlement scheme, uh, national settlement scheme to encourage people to come forward and, and register if they are in any, any doubt about their status. But also, we will be bringing forward an Australian-style points-based immigration uh, system uh, to make sure that all sectors have access to the labour they need. 
Any Mordaunt. Speaker, can I congratulate the Prime Minister on achieving so many things that the establishment said were impossible? Yeah. In light of that, in light of that, could I ask him to instruct the Cabinet Office to examine how we can bring an end to male primogeniture? and the ridiculous rules in the honours system which value women less than men, hopefully before he makes good on his undertakings to my honourable friend, the member for South End on Sea. <laughs> Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, speaking as the as the oldest son, who's never seen any particular benefits from that, uh, uh, I, 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 I understand. I understand completely uh, what what she what she says. Uh, I will I will I will reflect on on her request, and uh, I think she I think she speaks for many people around the country in wishing to see fairness and equality in the way we do these things. Ronnie Cowan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are families across the United Kingdom that have children suffering from epilepsy. Many have found that medical cannabis is a great help, but they have been driven to either act unlawfully or pay huge sums of money to gain access to medical cannabis. The Secretary of State for Health stated on the 19th of March that in several months' time it will be made available. Endor Payne wrote to the Prime Minister on the 19th of September and is still to receive an answer. When will the Prime Minister take the necessary actions required to ensure those children can access medical cannabis legally and at no cost? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I understand the uh, desperate uh, difficulties that uh, people who require uh, the medical use of cannabis uh, are going through, and of course, it is, I think, right that we have changed the way we do things. Uh, the uh, Chief Medical Officer and NH NHS England have made it clear that cannabis based products uh, can be prescribed for medicinal use. Uh, I think it must be up to doctors to decide uh, when it is in the best interest of their patients uh, to, to, uh, to do so. But can I invite him, since I, I can tell that it, my answer is not satisfying, can I, can I invite him? Uh, to, I will take it up personally with, uh, with him and also uh, with the Secretary of State uh, for Health. Uh, so that he gets the satisfaction that he needs, and more importantly, that his uh, constituent gets the reassurance uh, that they need. Sir Alan Duncan. Mr Speaker, when a, when a high-profile person has been wrongly accused of a sexual crime and has had his livelihood and reputation destroyed, following which the police, it seems, would rather, than, rather fight him in court than compensate him, might the Prime Minister consider making it clear to the police that it is their duty to address injustice rather than create and perpetuate it, and that they should pay compensation rather than waste taxpayers' money on malicious litigation designed to avoid doing so. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I, I completely agree with that. There is obviously a very difficult balance to be struck because clearly we do not wish in any way to discourage the police from, uh, from investigating and prosecuting offences wherever they may be, no matter how high uh, the people in office may, uh, may be. But not, nonetheless, where they do get it wrong and where they have manifestly got it wrong, then there should be a duty upon the police uh, not just uh, to apologise but also to make amends. Jim Cunningham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. When is the Prime Minister going to sort out the difference between the BBC and the Government in relation to his manifesto commitment at the last general election to implement free television licences for the over 75? Yeah, yeah. When is something going to be done about it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is up to the, the BBC has the funds, as, as the honourable gentleman knows uh, full well. Uh, it is there, and they they should they should they should be funding those free TV licences. And we continue to make that argument very vigorously uh, with the BBC. And uh, believe me, uh, he asked me to put the screws on the BBC. We certainly will. Lucy <laughs> Allen, Mr. Speaker. Telford needs its A&E and its Women and Children's Centre. It's a town that will have a population of 200,000 people within the next 10 years. A new town, a former mining town, with pockets of deprivation and poor health outcomes. 
And while funding is being pumped into the affluent county town of Shrewsbury, some 20 miles away, Telford is losing vital services. Will my right honourable friend reverse the decision of the Health Secretary to approve this plan? And will he urge him to listen to the needs and concerns of my constituents and the representatives of the local area? Uh, Mr Speaker, the, um, my, my honourable friend is a, is, a, is a battler for the people of Telford, as I've seen myself, and, uh, and she does a great deal of good work for, for them. I can tell her that, uh, as a first step, uh, the, my own right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, has called on the, uh, the A&E at the Princess Royal Hospital to stay open as an A&E uh, local, uh, and, but has asked to, for the NHS to come forward with further proposals uh, for better health care in Telford, uh, but I will certainly be taking up her further points uh, with him. Elmore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The elderly and the vulnerable are more at risk from scamming than ever before, and Age UK has highlighted just this week that when the Government's decision to scrap free TV licences for the over-75s will now put them at further risk of scamming, because they are now expecting fraudsters to go door-to-door collecting the licence fee once the Government's decision has been implemented. Can the Prime Minister can the Prime Minister please prioritise eco- the economic crime that scamming is? Give the police the funding they need to investigate and prosecute these crimes and reverse his decision to scrap the TV licences for over 75 yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I must, I, must, I must correct him more. He's just said about uh, our decision. It is the BBC. Who, it is the BBC. No, on the contrary. On the contrary. Uh, and, and I was very clear. I was very clear. In my, uh, no, come on. I, I really think, honourable uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, opposite, should, they should be clear about what's happening. Uh, it is up to the BBC to fund these licences. But on his point, of, on his, on his point about scamming, I think he's being reasonable, and uh, we will ensure that uh, we do give people the protection and the security they need, not least through another 20,000 uh, police officers on the streets of our country. Uh, order, given this widespread sadness that the very popular and respected member for Watford will be standing down at the next general election, it gives me great pleasure to call Mr Richard Harrington. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to be called. Because, <laughs> as, you, as you have pointed out, this unfortunately may be my penultimate uh, Prime Minister's questions. Uh, will, unfortunately, be your penultimate Prime Minister's questions, but I hope it will not be my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. Yeah. I, would like, I would like to ask... I would like to ask my uh, right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, if he's aware that for many people, many members like myself who voted for his bill last night, but voted against the programme motion, we would be delighted to accept a reasonable compromise for the proper scrutiny of this bill, and this was not a vote for revocation in disguise. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I, and I can just thank my, uh, my right honourable friend for his support, and uh, I, was, I thought he was going to ask about the hospital in Watford, Mr Speaker, uh, which I'm delighted to say is going to be, is going to be re- rebuilt along with uh, many others uh, across the country. And I congratulated him as a, as a Conservative member then and, and, uh, and, and delighted that he's, and, and on all the work he's done for, for Watford. Uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, the bill... Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm delighted that the House voted in favour of the bill. Unfortunately, as I say, they willed the end but not the means. Uh, The House of Commons has, alas, voted to delay Brexit again. Uh, We now must see what the EU uh, says about that request for a delay, and I'll be studying uh, their answer very closely to see how we proceed, Mr Speaker. Catherine West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last Saturday, the Haringey Football Club players experienced racist slurs were spat upon and experienced the most disgusting behaviour during a grassroots football match. Will the Prime Minister congratulate the manager Tom Lloyd Zhu for taking the players off, which is a very courageous decision, and can he explain to the House why bigotry has currently been emboldened under the current government? Mr. Speaker, I, 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 was, I was with, I was with the, uh, the, the honourable lady who, uh, until her last point, 
Uh, I certainly think that uh, racism in football is utterly disgusting and should be stamped out uh, at every possible opportunity. And uh, she will have seen what happened in Bulgaria. I'm delighted to say that uh, the head of the Bulgarian Football Association was dismissed uh, from his position as a result of what happened uh, in that match. We will certainly be making sure uh, that we do everything we can uh, to stamp out racism of any kind, wherever it takes place in this society, and whatever form it takes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Connectivity across Angus is one of the most urgent issues, and I want to see full coverage of mobile rollout throughout my constituency. So I wholeheartedly support the Shared Rural Network Initiative, which is joint between the government and the four main mobile providers, ensuring that we have mass and not spot areas, but also reciprocal agreements between the operators to ensure that my constituents and constituents across the United Kingdom have that access. So will the Prime Minister assure me that he understands that connectivity is a top priority in Angus, and will he ensure that the funding that needs to get into this initiative to get it going will be given uh, through, uh, well through their right channels. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, once again, the voice of Scotland and the voice of Angus. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, to my, my honourable friend. We are indeed, uh, d we are indeed in, engaged in uh, levelling up not just the provision of gigabit broadband across the whole of the country, uh, but also improving uh, 4G mobile signal as well. It is our ambition, uh, Mr Speaker, to have 95% of the UK covered by 4G uh, mobile signal. We have made changes to the regulations and the planning laws uh, to make it easier for the, uh, the the uh, infrastructure to be put in place, and uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, uh, Mrs. Speaker, has just assured me uh, that the uh, honourable lady's uh, particular request is going to be addressed. Order. The yeah. Mayor of London has cut air pollution in central London by a third yeah, yeah, yeah. in the first six months of his ultra low emission zone. Does the Prime Minister support the Mayor's plan to expand that zone? And does he still oppose the third runway at Heathrow that will reverse these gains? He's going to lie in front of the. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, 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 I'm as scandalised as the. Uh, honourable gentleman about the failure of the Mayor of London uh, to improve air quality, if that's what I understood him to just, uh, just to say. Uh, w w when, I was, when I was Mayor of London, Mr Speaker, well, I just uh, uh, pick a period entirely at random, uh, we, we cut uh, NOx, we cut nitrous oxide emissions uh, by, I think, uh, uh, 16%. We cut particulates by 20%. And, and I can tell him uh, that this, this government, this government, has, has the most far-reaching ambitions of any society in the EU to improve air quality. And as for, as for the Heathrow third runway, as for the Heathrow third runway, it, it, it remains the case that I have lively doubts about the ability of the promoters of that scheme, uh, the abilities of the promoters of that scheme, uh, as in, I think he does, to meet standards of air quality and on noise emissions. And we will have to see how the courts adjudicate in that matter. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. In this House, we defend forever the right of peaceful protest. Yet on the 15th of August, and just three weeks ago, pro-Pakistani organisations held violent protests outside the Indian High Commission. This Sunday, there is the threat of 10,000 people being brought to demonstrate outside the Indian High Commission on Diwali, the most holy day for Hindus, Sikhs and Jains. What action is the government going to take to prevent violent protests this Sunday? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I join my honourable friend who, who, who speaks for his, very strongly and well for his constituency in, in deploring uh, demonstrations that uh, end up being intimidating uh, in any way at all. Uh, my honourable friend will understand this is a police operational matter, but I know that I've just been speaking to my honourable uh, friend, the Home Secretary, and uh, she will be raising it uh, with the police. But we must all be clear, we must all be clear in this House that violence and in intimidation anywhere is wholly unacceptable in, in this country. Hi, Gamesbury. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Go on, Mike. Eight consultations on the millions of people are still caught by the least old scandal. Yeah. At what stage is the Prime Minister and his government going to get a grip and end this feudal system once and for all? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I thank the honourable gentleman, and he raises something that is, I know, of great importance to all of our constituents. And we are delivering a very strong package of reforms. We will legislate to ban new leasehold houses and, uh, in future, and reduce future ground rents uh, to zero. Reduce future ground rents to zero in all but exceptional circumstances, and we will uh, close the legal loopholes that currently subject uh, leaseholders to unacceptable costs. He raises a very important issue, and uh, believe me, Mr. Speaker, we are uh, we are on it uh, right now. Maine. Speaker, a toxic and carcinogenic bromate plume is threatening my constituency. There is plans to do it to drill a new gravel quarry in Smallford, which may disturb this plume and enter it into the watercourses. Can I ask his good officers to use um, influence with ministers to make sure the Environment Agency does not allow quarrying on this gravel pit until the bromate plume has been fully assessed on its toxicity? Uh, I, I, I thank my honourable friend for, for raising that point about, uh, about the toxic bromide plume. Uh, it reminds me of, of, of uh, the various emanations that we sometimes hear from uh, some parts of this house. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will get on immediately to the, um, uh, to the Environment Secretary and make sure that he, he, uh, she, he takes it up in the way that uh, she... Thank you, Mr Speaker. Women who face sexual abuse often stay silent and suffer alone. They blame themselves for the shame and guilt that they feel. They break down and cry alone because they feel no one will ever believe them and they fear repercussions if they speak out. The fear of not being believed means brave women put on a smile and go about their daily lives, an example of which we heard from my colleague, the member for Canterbury. This very silence provides the perpetrators of that abuse the very get-out-of-jail card they need. Today, I ask the most powerful man in the United Kingdom one simple question. Does he agree with me that any woman who is subjected to sexual abuse of any kind should be believed, yes or no? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I think she raises, if I may say, an absolutely crucial uh, issue that I think many people in this country feel is not being sufficiently addressed. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we've expanded the uh, provision of independent domestic violence advisors, individual, independent sexual abuse advisors, uh, because I do think that every woman in this country who is a victim or a potential victim of domestic violence or sexual abuse should feel that she has the certainty of knowing that there is somewhere she can go, someone she can turn to for reassurance and support. It is absolutely vital as a society that we do that. And I would say also that I do not believe that as a country we are doing enough to bring, the, uh, to bring a rapist to justice. I think the, the level of prosecu successful prosecutions for the crime of rape is frankly inadequate. And I wish to uh, raise that with the criminal justice system because I've looked at the numbers. They are not going in the right direction. Women must have the confidence that their crimes of uh, domestic violence and sexual abuse are treated seriously by uh, the, our law enforcement system. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Like me, I know the Prime Minister is a big supporter of Spaceport Cornwall, where we aim to be launching satellites into space from Europe's first horizontal spaceport by 2021. But in order to achieve this, we need government agencies to ensure that the contracts and regulations are in place. So will the Prime Minister use his offices to ensure that the UKSA and CAA have the resources they need and work at pace to make the most of this exciting opportunity? Very good. Very good. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I congratulate my honourable friend on what he is doing to promote uh, the, 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 the prospects of, the, of this new spaceport in Newquay that this government is, uh, is constructing, and I think he's doing an excellent, uh, outstanding job. And as he knows, Mr. Speaker, I think we all have a, a favourite candidate for the person uh, who might be uh, best placed to trial uh, one of the new uh, vessels that we propose to send uh, into space. So if it's a horizontal spaceport, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious it will, it will, t they will take off at a horizontal uh, trajectory. In which case, even if we were to recruit the right honourable gentleman opposite to be the first uh, pilot, there is a risk he would end up somewhere else on the earth. Uh, but maybe Venezuela uh, would be a good destination. Stuart Housie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am in favour of the EU single market. Here, here. I would vote for the EU single market. Did you hear Indeed, that? if the European Union didn't exist, 
we'd probably have to invent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not my words, the Prime Minister. Ah. So let me ask him, what well, was it about the trappings of power that led him to abandon reason, embrace Brexit and put so many jobs, so much trade and so much prosperity at risk across these islands? Yeah. Mr Speaker, as I, as, I think I, as I think I said in the House on on Saturday. There are, there are clearly uh, two schools of thought, two uh, sides of the, of the, of the British psyche uh, when it comes to the issue. And, uh, and the House has, has been divided as the country has been divided. But I happen to think that we, after 47 years of EU membership, in the context of an intensifying federalist agenda uh, in the EU, we have a chance now to make a difference about our national destiny and to seek a new and better future as a proud, independent, open, generous, global, free-trading economy. That is what we can do, Mr Speaker. That is the opportunity uh, that this country has, and I hope very much uh, that he will support it and help us to deliver Brexit, deliver on the mandate of the people, and get it done by October the 31st. Douglas Ross. Mr Speaker, last week saw the damaging US tariffs applied to many iconic Murray products such as single malt scotch whisky and shortbread. These industries had nothing to do with the dispute between the US and the EU, so what is the Government and the Prime Minister doing to try and get these tariffs removed as quickly as possible? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, uh, my honourable friend, it campaigns uh, valiantly for, on this issue, and he's absolutely right. And I, uh, both I and uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, have raised this matter personally with our, our counterparts in the United States. We, it, is a, it is a rank injustice uh, that Scotch, uh, Scottish whisky is being uh, penalised in the way that it is, and uh, we hope that those tariffs will be withdrawn as soon as possible. But it has been raised uh, repeatedly at the highest level. Yeah. Finally, Joe Swinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I would like to associate myself and my colleagues from these benches with the remarks that have been made earlier about the horrific deaths of 39 people mm. in Essex. Mr Speaker, it is good manners to say thank you when our friends help us out. So would the Prime Minister like to express his gratitude to the 19 Labour MPs who voted for his deal last night and to the Leader of the Opposition for meeting with him this morning to help push through his bad Brexit deal? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, well, I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, honourable lady for giving me that opportunity, and I do indeed my expre ex express my gratitude. I think I did. Uh, last night, and I'm happy to repeat again uh, today, for the avoidance of doubt, to all members of the House who uh, have so far joined uh, uh, the uh, movement to get Brexit done and uh, deliver on the, on the mandate of the people. I don't think I, I can yet count her in that number. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps I could ask her. Perhaps I could ask her in return to, to cease her missions to Brussels, uh, where she is, as to the best of my knowledge, been asking for them not uh, to give us a deal. Uh, I think. I think that was. I think that was. That, that, was, that, was a, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Uh, they have given us an excellent deal, and I hope very much, uh, in the, in the cross-party spirit that she uh, supports, that she will endorse that deal. Order.